Okay, so can we start? Uh, first off, uh, I, allow me to apologize for doing this in English, for not flip-flopping between English and Arabic. Uh, but, uh, however, I'll do my best to answer questions in Arabic uh, at the end. So, uh, hello everyone. My, my name is Mohamed Makhlouf. I am the head of security engineering at Karim. And uh, security engineering is, the org, is an org that reports into the CISO, the Chief Information Security Officer and is focused on solving security problems uh, using sound and principled engineering techniques, leveraging, uh, enge leveraging engineering to solve security problems effectively and at scale. So we are a group of systems and software engineers who are interested in the security domain and not the other way around. In today's talk, I'll share with you our journey as a startup maturing into uh, realization that security is actually a thing and uh, how we went about addressing the security problems at Karim from first principles. A disclaimer before we start, a word of caution. Uh, for those of you who came to this talk looking for something groundbreaking or remarkable uh, discoveries as the previous talks. Uh, be prepared to be disappointed in a grand way. Nothing that I'll say is uh, new discoveries or groundbreaking. However, it's more of a story, uh, uh, old-fashioned story in the slow process of maturing a security program at a startup. So while often talks about security is about how the fast pace of security and how the shifting landscape of threats can affect your security posture and uh, how security is a complex and fast moving target. Uh, this talk uh, is about the very slow process of growing or even instead brewing a security program or security culture at a startup that is cloud native, as in born and lives entirely on the cloud. So, in today's agenda, I'll be introducing our team uh, briefly and give you a bit of history around how our team came to, to be formed. Uh, then I'll talk about a bunch of anecdotal stories in no particular order. Uh, however, uh, there will be some emphasis on what you want to be focusing on or the aspects that you want to be focusing on in your first 100 days as a security program or as a security team. And I will touch upon, upon some aspects of how to do security at a cloud-native company, where the common perception is that if you're on the cloud, why do you even need a security team? Uh, then we will shift gears and start to speak about uh, a bit about zero trust network and what does it mean for us to approach zero trust networks uh, from the original papers published by Google, Google uh, about Beyond Corp and how to practically distill and apply those concepts at your young or mature company. And finally, I will close off with a, a bunch of lessons learned and key takeaways, and in the hopes that you will find some broad strokes of usefulness in what I have to share with you today. So our team is the security engineering team and it is often confused at other companies with engineering security, uh, where people think that the only focus is on addressing engineering teams' security problems, and uh, perhaps by providing them guidelines or policies to engineers on how do you do and how do you design software to be secure by design. Uh, while indeed this is a major part and effect and a important part that our team does, it does not capture the essential uh, thesis or the central, central thesis uh, or the idea behind the formation of the team. Security engineering is a team of systems and software engineers who are interested in solving problems of security using software or perceiving the security problem as a software problem. So to put it in a more straightforward uh, manner, everyone on the security engineering team passes the bar of engineering. So everyone is a software engineer and have a solid background in software engineering. And we perceive security problems at the company as a software problem that requires a reliable engineering approach to be solved. This approach of addressing problems in the security domain and uh, uh, as an engineering challenge allows us to think of the problems 
fundamentally from first principles, taking a physics-like approach to uh, solving and overcoming these challenges. Following a principle-based approach to our architecture instead of a precedent-based approach in systems design, uh, and leveraging automation capabilities to overcome the shortage of secure, uh, skilled security talent, particularly in our region. So security engineering as a team looks after uh, these various areas, detection and response, and this group is mainly focused on building the infrastructure for our autonomous SOC, uh, building internet scale logging and monitoring capabilities to allow us to run both an effective and an efficient SOC, where autonomy is mostly focused on eliminating or reducing the noise that the SOC analysts have to evaluate, and actually free, freeing your SOC analysts to be able to focus on activities such as threat hunting. Uh, also, the goal for this group is to do this in a, a cloud-native approach. It does not make sense for us to have a SOC physically sitting uh, somewhere uh, in one of our geographies when all our systems are run in the cloud. So doing this in a cloud-native way that does not make us pay ridiculous licensing fees uh, to a blue or green logoed vendor. I won't mention names. Application security, uh, this, is a, this group is a mixture of red teamers and systems engineers who are focused on eliminating entire classes of vulnerabilities and security bugs from our entire tech stack by taking an expanded view across the entire hierarchy and layers of complex abstractions in a modern cloud-native container orchestrated uh, environment. They start from a threat model to our systems by threat modeling our systems perform activities such as statically analyzing our entire code bases. We have thousands of code repositories, so doing that at scale is a bit of an engineering challenge in itself. Uh, writing security tests, dynamically testing systems in adversarial runtimes with uh, activities such as DAST, EAST, and RASP to uncover and eradicate entire uh, classes of vulnerabilities and systematically and continuously augmenting the efforts uh, of our vulnerability discovery and closure, uh, among other red teaming activities that, that we do. The infrastructure protection and the tooling team uh, is mainly focused on how do you design infrastructure in the cloud to be secure by design and making those configuration decisions and how do you design your uh, infrastructure is key to uh, a, a safe infrastructure and resilient infrastructure that is repeatable and is uh, ephemeral. The group is mostly also focused on building continuous assets discovery capability. How do you continuously discover all the assets that the company uh, uh, owns? And in cloud native environments, you could have tens of thousands of running containers uh, at any given point in time, and you have thousands and thousands of uh, uh, servers and instances, and the number of servers is dynamically growing or shrinking over time based on the load. So dynamically being able to capture what is the assets that you care about at that point in time is also an engineering challenge in itself. And finally, our newest team is the privacy engineering team, and this is a group that is a cross-functional team and is tasked with designing systems to respect our users, uh, customers, captains, and colleagues' uh, privacy by design with things such as differential uh, privacy as well as tokenization. And it's a very new team, and it's an ongoing effort. Okay. So how does a security program at a small startup or a young company feels like? Uh, well, it is in the vast majority of cases, and more often than not, uh, it has to do with a set of unfortunate events uh, that take place and leads your company to start to think of security as not an optional thing. And post-breach, companies have to deal with a variety of activities from, first of all, admitting that a breach took place, to the set of PR campaigns by our uh, fellows at security vendors and the avalanche of security consultancies that are trying to sell you the next-gen, next-gen, next-gen thing. So 
regardless of what is the reason that makes your startup or a small company to start to think about, or a young company to start to think about security, it is always feels like starting at the bottom of the hill. You're always uh, in a disadvantaged uh, place. Uh, <clears throat> where chaos is king and every, everybody in the company has a root equivalent access to everything. Visibility is quite foggy and obtaining a state of the nation type of report, if you want to know what is the status of my infrastructure, my systems and everything that I have, it's a very difficult task to achieve because the, everything is in flux. And uh, how much of your infrastructure, for instance, or libraries are vulnerable or running outdated software, that could be a very difficult engineering question to ask or to answer. These are all a lot of difficult uh, questions to which the answers uh, would be a lot of rework that would be needed to done by your engineering team as well as you as a young security uh, uh, program or a security team. So if you ever heard the term greenfield project in security, that greenfield is more often than not a very green dumpster that is unfortunately on fire most of the time. However, if you put aside the idea of everything is on fire, it's all bad when you start at a young company, a young startup, there is no security controls. But if we put that aside and we think from first principles, logically, what are the things or the pillars of a good security program, and you start to think about them, you want to, first of all, have secure products. You want to design systems and software to be secure by design and that are threat modeled pretty well. You need to have your engineers and both your security engineers as well as your, or the rest of your engineering body to understand the threat model of the systems that they are building. So that is secure products. You want resilient infrastructure. You want to design your infrastructure to be resilient, repeatable, to be able to distinguish between pristine state and compromised state. You want to do something about vulnerability management, and you want to put in place a well-defined process and tools to allow you to handle the discovery and closure of vulnerabilities. Uh, you want to have an incident management process. You want to define what actually constitutes a incident, a security incident that you can wake security engineers in the middle of the night for. As your company grows over time, uh, your company will more often than not start to deal with vendors, a variety of vendors, and these vendors will be in direct touching your customer data. And it becomes a, a very important thing to think really hard about what qualifies a vendor to become your partner as a company. Also, as your company grows, as a, in Karim's case, company grew, uh, you start to acquire other smaller startups, you start to buy other smaller companies, and they, in turn, can become your weakest link. So having a process and a way of thinking about how do you integrate their infrastructure, code, and systems, and databases into your system is something to take into account. You also want to do uh, something about training. So training your uh, engineers as well as the rest of the population of your company and the employees on matters ranging from phishing training all the way to threat modeling, runtime, substrate safety, and Kubernetes and whatnot uh, type of things. Finally, you want to put in place a set of well-defined policies and mechanisms to make it difficult or close to impossible to fault those policies. And so while it is clear that what are the pillars of a good security program, and we know what needs to be done uh, in, in a sense, the path to getting to that successful security program is quite often, it, it will vary dramatically from one company to the other. And when security program is still young and you're still a young security team at a large multinational corp company, or that, that become a startup become into a multinational corporation, and you're still a small team, you can be easily swayed into different directions very easily 
uh, based on either a, an attack that leads you down a certain path to build defenses in certain areas, or, and, or your business needs could change, and that could force your security team to defocus from one aspect and try to focus on another aspect. So your progress will be quite non-deterministic. We don't know, are you actually making progress forward or are you making progress backwards? It's very difficult to tune and capture which direction you are, uh, you're making progress in. However, all companies that care about security and privacy will end up in the, in the end in roughly the same place with a healthy and mature security program. Getting there won't be the same and there is no clear recipe on how to get there. And much like our friend here in the photo, this is on a day-to-day -day basis, this is how it feels like to be at a security team, in a, a small security team or a new uh, security team. <coughs> so let's talk about zero trust networks. But before we dive into what is a zero trust network, let's consider a traditional network security architecture. And this should seem familiar to a lot of us, quite a uh, simplistic high overview of what a network architecture at a typical uh, companies would look like. You, we, this is very prevalent and, and a very known architecture to us security uh, practitioners where we apply security measures and security controls at the perimeter of our network. We add all the security controls, the latest next-gen firewalls, and you slap them into your uh, uh, perimeter network. And effectively building a solid wall around the perimeter, making it solid on the outside, but very soft on the inside, uh, where if an attacker gets, hold, uh, gets access to your internal network, the blast radius would be total. So attackers would be able to move laterally, elevate privileges, exfil data, and we as an industry, we know that this for fact doesn't work very well, however, we still employ this even when we go to a cloud-native company. People brings, bring this type of thinking to cloud-native setups. Anyways, <clears throat> so what is zero trust? Zero trust is actually a concept that Google came up with back in 2010. Uh, they published uh, a set of research papers and it was dubbed Beyond Corp. Uh, zero trust can mean different things to different companies. Uh, however, Google's uh, take on what is a zero trust network is pretty solid. And they've published a set of papers that start from describing what is the concept of a zero trust network, how they went about and implement a zero trust network at Google. Uh, these are the papers. You can see they started publishing in 2014 and the last paper published in 2017. And so what does zero trust mean? Zero trust means that for every connection inside of your network, inside of your system, any, anyone trying to connect to an asset that you care about, all the devices that are connecting to that asset needs to be authenticated and authorized. All the users that are in your network that are trying to reach an important asset that you care about need to be both authenticated and authorized and the decision whether you would allow that access to happen or not needs to be dynamically computed based on a set of risk factors and a computation that you decide whether you would let it happen or not happen. So if I'm trying to connect to a production database that con contains actual customer data from my iPad in Starbucks, the answer to that should be no. If I am, as a security engineer, trying to connect to the production database from my engineering workstation at my home network that I've connected to from before, the answer to that should be yes. So you need to factor in this. You need to be able to make those decisions dynamically uh, based on these factors changing. It's also important to highlight what zero trust is not. So zero trust is not a product, despite a lot of vendors telling you that we have the next gen zero trust product that you can stick into your network and you become zero trust. More often than not, that's not a true, true case. So it's more of a process. It is not new. There is no new technologies involved. There is no breakthrough in the technology. It's all, all of it is old tech that has been uh, around for a while. It's just the way you organize this te technology. And it's very rarely implemented 
at before a serious or an actual breach. Okay, so why it's important for us to do a zero trust network? There are some benefits to having zero trust network. When you treat the inside of your network as if it is the public internet and you move towards micro uh, perimeters, it makes you think of even internally all of your subsystems, all of the services that you have in a micro service architecture, they need to become, uh, the, the threat model shifts and you need to think of it as if you, the inside of your network is the public internet, it's the outside. So every subsystem, every service needs to be properly authenticated and properly authorized. All the traffic inside, on the inside of your network is treated as if it's coming from the outside. So you apply the same uh, controls for authentication and authorization. And that leads to making your lateral movement on the inside for an attacker much harder because every service has, has to be authenticated. If you move from one service to another inside of the network, at each stage, you will hit authentication and authorization walls. Uh, and that be, your internal network is no longer permissive. Stolen credentials are far less valuable. If you manage to steal credentials to one service, does not mean that you have a total blast radius and you got everything on the inside. Uh, exploitable known vulnerabilities become quite rarer because you overall have an increased ecosystem hygiene and far less noise, and non-targeted attacks become much less of much less value, and that focuses forces your attackers to th that are only targeting you for for whatever reason. So there are in our journey we went through a set of problems that that we needed to address in order to achieve a zero trust network. Problem number one is user identity and access. This is a, a crucial bit to having a zero trust network. So first, how do you verify endpoint integrity? And we have anywhere between tens of thousands of EC2 instances, uh, Amazon servers, and we have uh, several thousand endpoints for laptops, mobile phones that are connecting to our networks. So it's a, quite a heterogeneous uh, uh, population of endpoints that you need to cater for. So we looked at things that are based on OS query, Capsule 8. Uh, we looked at optics, Collide, and we have our own internal uh, in-house built uh, security observability platform, a logging and monitoring capability. Uh, for our endpoints, we went with a commercial uh, offering from uh, Carbon Black, AirWatch, and it's integrated with device trust authentication via Okta. Uh, another bit that you need to, a uh, question that you need to answer is, is the person accessing the data actually authorized and uh, have appropriate rights to that role? And this is where a very boring thing like your Oracle HR database, an org chart that defines everybody's role, becomes very critical in, in, uh, in knowing whether people are authorized or not, which people are members of the engineering org and which people are not members of the engineering organization. And how do you centrally streamline onboarding and offboarding of cloud services? How do you give access to people and how do you remove access from people? Uh, this is where centralized SSO services like stuff like Okta, Do, and AWS IAM uh, are crucial to achieve that. Uh, AWS accounts that we have have only an Okta and cloud formation roles, so there are no user accounts on our AWS accounts. Everything is managed via uh, our external SSO from Okta, and the only access that our, our AWS accounts have is a cloud formation, which allows you to run code, uh, do infrastructure as code, and run IAC codes uh, automatically. Uh, we looked at how do you minimize credential theft. So we looked at uh, offerings from uh, uh, hardware keys, like uh, U U2F devices like YubiKey. Uh, and how do you enforce the data classification policy at a company that is completely in the cloud? We went to with the G Suite Enterprise for our DLP solution. Another problem that you want to address into achieving a zero trust network is actually looking at your source code, the, the, the services that we actually build ourselves in our own application security. So how do you do uh, binary authorization? How do we validate and ensure that only trusted container images can be deployed to our production environment? How do you remove the human from the deployment process to eliminate 
human error during deployment processes and people in a uh, compromised machine for our, one of our engineers should not lead to a, something that is compromised in the production uh, environment. Signing and annotating images during the continuous integration phase, keys and secrets management, all our secrets and keys that we use to c communicate between the microservices and microservices reaching to uh, things like our databases, our caches, other systems, the, and it's a, we have a very complex uh, distributed system that is microservice-based architecture. So managing secrets is a nightmare and in a, such an environment. You don't have just one or two or 10 databases. We have hundreds of databases. So managing access and credentials to these systems is a, a small engineering challenge in itself. So we rely on Amazon's KMS and uh, a Secrets Manager to maintain the secrets. Uh, we do not have uh, IM, IM service type accounts, so we don't use Amazon's uh, accounts to communicate with the uh, uh, services that we are utilizing from Amazon or our own infrastructure that we run on Amazon making it, there's no AWS keys, account keys that could leak and we rely on instance profiles. And access is restricted by environment. The strongest isolation in a cloud native environment is the Amazon account. You can have multiple AWS accounts. You do not need just one. You can have hundreds and thousands of AWS accounts. You can isolate using the AWS account as an isolation form is the strongest form of isolation in a cloud native environment. And all the keys are automatically rotated every 90 days. Another aspect that is also very important for uh, improving our application security is threat modeling and our engineers understanding what are the threat models that our systems are dealing with and having a better security understanding for our products uh, and our systems. So we went and developed a lightweight threat modeling framework based on uh, OWASP's Threat Dragon. It's an open source tool that allows you to do a bit of threat modeling. We've enhanced the threat modeling capabilities of Threat Dragon. We added integration for authentication and authorization. We've enabled real-time sharing, so you can actually be drawing a threat model and someone on the other side, a team in a different country, can uh, see what you're doing and did some integrations with Jira and Confluence for reporting. Uh, we produced a practical threat modeling training course to train the rest of our engineering body, and this allows us to shift security left in our uh, SDLC or in our pipeline of development. So stuff like uh, SAST, statically analyzing uh, static uh, analysis and security testing uh, happens very early on in our development lifecycle before any code is actually going anywhere near our production environments. Uh, we run fuzzing tests, we do uh, DAST, dynamic application security testing, and we take our source code and run it in adversarial environments and see what could potentially go wrong. We run a lot of tests way early on in the, uh, in the development lifecycle before the code actually is anywhere near production. Problem number three is how do we look at our infrastructure protection and here you want to ensure how are your systems are patched in a timely manner. We looked at vulnerability management systems, uh, some commercial offerings as well as open source solutions. For instance, Tenable. Uh, who owns what asset or resource? How many assets do you have? How many things in your AWS environment you have uh, anywhere between 100 to 1,000 AWS account, and you have so many assets inside of there, how do you discover all of these assets and actually plot a graph of that? So there is an open source tool called Cloud Mapper by Do Security. Uh, it allows you to direct it at a set of AWS accounts, and it will fetch all of the assets and draw a graph database, put all that in a graph database to correlate all of your assets. But it wasn't designed for uh, a, accounts that are the size of Karim's account uh, initially. So we had to do some work into improving, uh, adding some uh, a graph database, dgraph, as a backend for Cloud Mapper. How do you quickly mitigate DDoS or other abuse activities and using uh, WAFs and uh, AWS Shield? How do you make it harder for attackers to move laterally? How do you design infrastructure for appropriate segregation using the multi-account segregation uh, capabilities, using VPCs, uh, virtual private clouds, to segment your uh, 
cloud network. These are uh, uh, separate accounts are far stronger as, as a separation mechanism than VPCs, but sometimes you, you, it's very difficult to break a monolithic account and you have to still do VPC segregation. How do you inform, enforce cloud security policies and how do you design your infrastructure to be ephemeral? I can throw away the account and start over with no impact to the business. And that requires a lot of automation and infrastructure as code. So, Some lessons learned from our journey towards a zero trust network as it's an ongoing exercise. You're never done with doing a, secure, a zero trust network. Each pillar of a security program that you, a young security program that you're building can be addressed in parallel. However, it's important to look at building root mechanisms first. So if you don't have a central SSO, everything we've discussed would become a nightmare to achieve. So there are some root mechanisms that you want to think about first. The user experience does matter. You can't just walk into a company and shut everyone's laptops because we installed Carbon Black and had to lock everyone out. So thinking about how do you address, how do you communicate to a body of more than 5,000 people that there are changes that suddenly gonna happen to their endpoints and their uh, systems and that they will not be able to connect to the network unless some security controls are in place. There will be a lot of automation required in order to achieve this. A lot of these problems cannot be done in an Excel sheet. You cannot retain an asset register for uh, a cloud native company in an Excel sheet because it moves dynamically as the traffic increases or decreases. So it will constantly be obsolete. So you need a automated way of gathering this information. Different organizations will have different takes on this. This was Karim's uh, approach to, to Zero Trust Network, and you will have a different approach to that if you choose to uh, implement Zero Trust Network in your company. And finally, I'd like to give a shout out to my team, and thank you very much. I'll answer questions in both English and Arabic. So. But tell them Arabic. All right. Question. Thank you very much, Khlou. Uh, Thank you. And I'm just well. بالنسبة لل acquiring بتاع Uber لكريم how this match they apply security like they have certain guidelines and should apply it with it or you have different security we will be separate companies for the foreseeable future so we are owned by Uber by by the end of the deal but we are going to become a separate entity for the foreseeable future. So, so for, I mean, for security, you're still having your own policies, your own process, your own everything. We were the first teams at Karim to meet uh, our counterparts at Uber. Uh, and yes, there are a lot of collaboration. However, the infrastructure and the systems will remain uh, separate. So we, we will continue to be a separate company and we will continue to have a security, a separate security function although more collaboration with our counterparts uh, and our owner, new owner, but uh, we, we are a separate entity. Um, another question, just in case. So the issue of privacy that is happening, is this also part of your domain in yes. cybersecurity? So how do you handle this stuff? In so first step is to know where are your PIIs. If you have a system that is uh, 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 microservice architecture, you have thousands of services and your data is scattered across hundreds of databases. Uh, step one is to identifying the PII and identifying which regulations that you need to follow and which do apply in your case. In our case, it's quite complex. It's, uh, it's becoming one of the biggest team in, in our group because it's a, a, a cross-functional effort every engineering team have to think where do PII, uh, how the PII travels through the system, where is it stored, where is it cached, and w what are we liable for, and how do we design systems to minimize the, the, 
the flux of PII throughout our system. So it's an ongoing effort. Uh, we are not subject to uh, GDPR except for European uh, nationals who use our system. Uh, but again, in general, as a company, we want to respect users' privacy and minimizing the amount of PII that is uh, moving through our system and applying techniques such as tokenization and uh, differential privacy for, for com doing machine learning modeling, removing the PII from the data before uh, using it for any machine learning uh, aspects, uh, uh, optimizations, and tr trying to remove the PII from traveling freely across our system. So that's still an ongoing effort. Asela, questions? A uh, quick question. Um, uh, you, you were mentioning the everything is on the cloud, uh, and you <coughs> uh, said uh, you don't have a security operation center uh, that manages yes. uh, anything for you. Like, is it is this the the approach that you're having is to have everything on the cloud, but without it, like uh, an analyst actually sitting down? And, and we have a SOC in, in Lahore and Pakistan. So we have a, a team that sets that does the secure SOC analysts, a group of SOC analysts. However, we, we address the problem of the SOC. To, we're trying to build an autonomous SOC. So if something we know about and something we can uh, have enough evidence that it is bad, we are taking an offensive measure towards just very defensive and we, we assume that it's bad. And so uh, if we can automatically classify any activity, whether process coming up on someone's endpoint or some certain pattern in the network that we consider to be bad, we are very protective and we just shut it down until we, it's proven otherwise. So we, the analysts are doing more of the threat uh, hunting activities than just dealing with repeated having alert fatigue and sitting and, and watching the, the red light syndrome when you get a lot of alerts day and night. Okay, got it, thanks. Thank you. No. So we had the breach in 2018. We are not obligated to publicly discuss this. Uh, but by the laws and the geographies we operate. However, we chose uh, in 2018, in January 2018, to publicly admit that we've been breached, and that was before the formation of the security team. And after the breach announcement, the security team was formed, and we haven't had a major or even minor data leakage or breach since that time. I hope so. <laughs> So we're good. Okay. Thank you.